else want a whiskey? Yeah. All right, look, pay attention, everybody. Wadsworth, am I right in thinking there is nobody else in this house? No. Then there is someone else in this house. No, sorry, I said no meaning yes. No meaning yes? Look, I want a straight answer. Is there someone else or isn't there yes or no? Um, well, there is still some confusion as to whether or not there's anybody else in this house. I told you there isn't. There isn't any confusion or there isn't anybody else? Either or both. Just give me a clear answer. Certainly. <clears throat> What was the question? Is there anybody else in the house? No! no! 1985's Clue, directed by Jonathan Lynn, starring Eileen Brennan, Tim Curry, Madeline Kahn, Christopher Lloyd, Michael McKean, Martin Mule, and Leslie Ann Warren. Let's take a quick look. Every person in this room has the perfect motive. Stand back! For murder. What do you mean? Murder. But only one of these suspects is the murderer. Is it the timid Mr. Green? Why are you screaming? Because I'm right out one! Screaming! Or the militant Colonel Mustard? Oh, if I was the killer, I would kill you next. Huh? I said half. Half. Mrs. White, who helped her husband on his way. What's well, a matter of life after death? Now that he's dead, I have a life. Ah! Miss Scarlet, who's helped many men along the way. Practice makes perfect. Huh. Professor Plum, who's looking for a way. I'm looking, I'm looking. Mrs. Peacock. I have absolutely no idea what we're doing here, but I am determined to enjoy myself. Or did the butler do it? No. 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 Paramount Pictures invites you to an evening of mystery. Let us in, let us in, let us out, let us out! Murder. This is getting quite serious. And madness. <laughs> In the movie that makes a scene of the crime. So it! Clue. It's not just a game anymore. So welcome back to the Cult of Films. I'm your host, John. And today we're talking about cult film-ish. I don't know. We'll let the audience decide, but that is 1985's Clue. And I'm not doing this alone tonight. I'm joined by an alcoholic beverage. More on that later. Tonight I am joined by the man that's always killing it in the studio with the camera. And that is Rad Entertainment's proprietor, Tony Walters. Thanks for coming back, man. Thanks, John, for having me on the show. I'm really excited to talk about Clue because it's not just a game anymore. <laughs> oh, yes. Killing it all over. There's going to be so many puns and oh, my God. Uh, That's the tagline on the poster. <laughs> oh, perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, yeah, directed by Jonathan Lynn, but Jonathan Lynn pretty much did just that. Uh, he wa This was produced by Deborah Hill, a co-writer and producer from all your favorite John Carpenter films. She was actually John Carpenter's uh, like ex-girlfriend. Uh, Deborah Hill was responsible for like Halloween and whatnot, so she produced this. And then the story, everything about Clue w was pretty much made by John Landis. John Landis penned the entire script. He did the screenplay. He couldn't really figure out a good ending for it, so he made like four. Uh, but he wound up not being able to have the time to actually sit in the director's chair, so he handed it off to Jonathan Lynn. Um, yeah, I don't know. Are you a big John Landis fan, Tony? I am a John Landis fan, and I kind of wish John Landis would have actually directed this movie because I think that there's a lot of really fun stuff in the writing, but I feel like the performances in it might lack a little bit, and I think it could have maybe would have helped from John Landis. I do enjoy the majority of John Landis's work, so yeah, there's that. Absolutely. And uh, before we jump too much deeper into into the uh, into the mystery, so to speak, I am joined by, you know, I think I'm going to get killed in my oh. in my studio by the Bushmills. Uh, and that is uh, this is kind of cool, though. I have this is like a harken back to a, a Roger Rabbit joke uh, when, when they ask Eddie Valiant if he wants scotch on the rocks and he means ice. These are actually like scotch rocks. So these are actual rocks that you put in your freezer uh, for whiskey. Or, or scotch or bourbon or for whatever have you. So I have some frozen rocks with my Bushmills. Uh, are you joined by a special guest? I am. Today I'm drinking Freedom Rock. It's a Sun King Brewery uh, Session IPA. Freedom Rock, uh, it's Maximum Freedom and Maximum Rock. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, is that an Indiana staple? Uh, yeah, it's a Sun King's uh, Indianapolis Brewery. Nice, nice. All right, well, Lahayim. 
Uh, you know what? Those rocks didn't really stay cold for too long because that's just kind of <laughs> room tempered uh, Irish whiskey. But nevertheless, yeah. So you know, you think about this this movie, and we kind of mentioned who was involved, who, who produced it. You know, Deborah Hill is is fantastic. Uh, Jonathan Landis is no slouch. Uh, and the cast is absolutely phenomenal, but the the fact of the matter is, this thing had a budget of fifteen million dollars. It made fourteen point six, and it's not even like if if you look on like critically, it wasn't even really well received, and it's kind of hit or miss. It's kind of hit or miss with audiences as well. So I, I think there's something to be said. What, what you said, maybe if John Land is kind of owned it too because if you look at the 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 career of Jonathan Lynn the only I mean he had films like this was probably his best film arguably because he did do My Cousin Vinny and that's a good film too but he went on to do like Sergeant Bilko and and all this other schlock like he could not make a good movie I'm I'm just now looking through and My Cousin Vinny probably is the best movie that he made and My Cousin Vinny is a really good movie but My Cousin Vinny is also Got a really, really solid cast of people kind of playing the characters they always play. So they're doing what they know. And the problem with Clue really is you have all this, these, this, you have this really great cast, but their performances are just kind of lackluster because they're all kind of not playing their type. Like Christopher Lloyd's not super crazy and outlandish in this movie. He's plays it pretty straight, and that's not. That's not Christopher Lloyd. Like, if you're going to bring Christopher Lloyd, make sure you're giving him a really ridiculous character to play. <laughs> and it's even like Tim Curry is, is like, I was really worried the first time I saw this, like, halfway into it. I'm like, Tim Curry's not doing the Tim Curry thing until, like, <laughs> right. kind of the third act when he, like, turns into, a, a like, a Tim Curry cartoon character. And then it's fabulous. Like, that's best Tim Curry right there. But, you know, I, I think, like, the performances I don't think were the problem, because I think Michael Sheen, or, my, I'm sorry, Michael McKean, who plays Mr. Green in it, I thought he was, he kind of steals the show. Uh, Leslie Ann Warren, who I kept thinking was Susan Sarandon. Did you get that vibe? Like, <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I kept, like, I even as, like, a child when I watched this film, I thought it was Susan Sarandon until I rewatched it, like, now, now that I'm in my 30s, in prep for this show. I was like, wait, what? Because I even think I put on Twitter, I posted on Twitter, I'm like, Susan Sarandon is one of the best parts of the film. And <laughs> that's why no one responded. <laughs> that's pretty great. I'll agree, Michael McKean's performance is probably the best one, but, uh, and Tim Curry, I had the same exact thought process, like, oh, well, he's kind of playing it pretty straight until that, you know, the final final act, really. Yeah, it's uh, and he he wasn't even the first choice. I think Jonathan Lynn wanted Rowan, Ronan Atkinson for this uh, role. He was considered, but he just didn't have the uh, kind of gravitas at the moment. Nineteen eighty five. Yet, I don't I don't even think Mr. Bean was out yet. Curry was just coming off a of Rocky Horror, so he had that kind of buzz about him. I think he was kind of the biggest star. But also, you know, Madeline Kahn, I think, delivers a fantastic Madeline Kahn performance. I don't think I've ever seen a bad performance from her. She has the best line, uh, which is real funny, because it, it, although it seems like this film seems very... Uh, funny and madcap. They they did not let them improv at all, except for her, her flames on the side of the head, and only that. And we'll get to that uh, why why that was such a tragic scene, uh, because some people didn't even see it that saw this film. Uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't really thoroughly. I didn't really thoroughly enjoy her performance, and uh, I hated Mister Body uh, leaving. <laughs> Yeah. Just the just the worst performance. I don't know. He was in like Fear and MD forty five. So he was like kind of like a old school like uh, Lee, Lee, Lee Ving was a like an old school punk rocker, or, you know, kind of butt rocker uh, of the of the eighties and stuff like that. So I mean, luckily they didn't have to give him too much to do. Right. I mean, I'm glad he didn't have too much to do, but his performance just every time he spoke annoyed me. And then when. Basically, like right when things are about to get laid out on the table and he freaks out and he's going to try and leave and break out the window. I hated all of that so much. <laughs> I just like quit letting this guy talk. Like I knew he was going to die because his name was Mr. Body. Like, right. He was going to die. And I was like, please just kill him now because I'm sick of listening to him talk. <laughs> See, and I think that's the I think one of the, the biggest issues with Clue the movie, uh, you know, because when you see it when you're young, when I saw it when I was young, I thought it was cool because this is literally the first like game 
movie you get. This is this pre, uh, predates all the the video game films, all all the other board game films, I guess. Uh, but you know, this is this was the first adaptation of a board game to to the screen, and that's why a lot of the, you know the studio was looking at John Landis just like, the, yeah, it seems like a fun kind of gimmicky project, but there's no real story here. How are you going to make a feature length film? And even though it's only 97 minutes, you know, you have to technically be 90 minutes to be considered a feature film. It feels long. Like, doesn't it feel like it could really use some good editing? Oh, for sure. <clears throat> well, it suffers too. Cause it's just because of the time it came out, it's a little dated in its pacing, so it feels really slow. Uh, it's it is a movie that I was kind of checking my watch. You know what I mean? I was, especially that second act. The second act really drags. Once the third act kicks in and Tim Curry's doing his thing and he's running back and forth between all the rooms and all that, it it finally feels like the movie I thought I was going to watch because I've never I had never seen this movie before. I knew it existed. I, I I caught bits of it maybe on TV growing up or something, but I never actually like really sat down and watched it until. Uh, you know, he asked me to do this review. So I was like, all right, let's check it out. I have friends that really love this movie. So I've heard about it a lot. And when I sat down to watch it, that third act is what I thought the movie was going to be like. So when it finally got to that point, I was like, all right, finally, it felt like I could breathe because I was just like kind of bored for the most of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and because it's it, it doesn't really it's a little disjointed, right? It doesn't know if it wants to go. It, at times, it feels like a full-on comedy, like a like a fall-down slapstick comedy. Uh, you know, when Tim Curry's running up the stairs, and I think he has um, he has Mrs. Peacock, and he, he's just, no, no, I think he has Miss White or whatever, and she's like halfway up the stairs, and then he just drops her on her face. Like it has these like or or the candlestick like falling off the the door frame and hitting Tim Curry right in the head. If it, it has these Looney Tune esque like slapstick moments, but then it gets kind of then then it really really slows down to like a screeching halt and almost tries to take itself seriously as like a, a murder mystery but watching the film it's impossible to to try to figure out like once they get to the conclusion of the film it doesn't matter if you've watched this thing a hundred times and, and then ha you know didn't watch the ending it that's not what the point was you, the point wasn't uh, to have the audience figure out who who did it, you know, in what room uh with what weapon it was just to have this kind of it was just to kind of watch a board game. I think they were, I think it was on purpose that, that Jonathan Landis and, and Jonathan Lynn were going for, or John Landis rather, were going for uh, the randomness. Like they were trying to capture the randomness of an actual board game where, you know, when you play Clue, it's it's a different outcome every time. It's very random. And I think that's what they were going for, but that did not translate at all really to, to the screen. I can gather that. I just think that it's back to I, if John Landis would have directed, I think it would have felt like it had more life in it because that's because it, it plays it so down the whole time. And it does try to play it serious in the beginning. And that's where it loses the fun of what would be playing a board game, I guess. But actually, if you think about it, playing Clue, Clue is a pretty slow game in general. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, like only faster than maybe Monopoly. Yeah, it, it right. is a sloth for sure. But again, is that what you want to capture, you know, to get butts in seats? I think somebody had to have, like the studio had to have been like, we need to make a, you know, we need to make this movie. So let's tap John Landis because he's kind of the big guy right now, the big writer right now. Let's tap him. And he's like, I'll write it, but I'm not going to direct this. Like, he, like, he, like he knew he knew what it was, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's. I, I mean, I feel like we're shitting on this movie, and, and rightfully so, because you know, admittedly, I don't think it holds up as much as it did when you know when when I was younger, or even like I think I watched it again like ten years ago, where I'm like, no, this is still a pretty fun movie, and it is. I think that what does work really well are are the performances. I think if you didn't have such uh, a, an amazing cast of comedians. This would have completely, you know, been quote unquote dead on arrival. Uh, you, you know, it just has these little moments that are so memorable and so quotable. Like, where else are you gonna see like, uh, you know, the singing telegram girl just like open the door and then like someone just like blow her away? And that turns out to be um, Jane Jane Weldon from Go Go's. I, I love that little cameo, you know. Um, but, but there are these, you know back and forths that are that are really funny when they're happening when the when the tension is like ratcheted up and everyone is just kind of scrambling i think that they they handle that very well because of these like snl type actors where uh you know lesser 
lesser known actors or, or lesser qualified comedians would have just it, it just would have been a, a big mess and, and non cohesive. But I think that's where the movie shined was when things were just super crazy. When things get super crazy is where it shines because it, it actually has a little bit of life into the story and it's and it it kind of even speeds up the pacing a little bit because it's cutting back and forth a lot more like quickly than what it would be before because in all the regular conversation it kind of lets it breathe a little bit which is nice and that you get that a lot with older films and that's kind of where the pacing issues start to happen but my biggest issue with the dialogue is that for the majority of the movie they're all just yelling at each other <laughs> but it's handled well I, I like the timing of it though <laughs> it's it's very like quippy it, it's almost like watching like a like i don't know like a judd apatow like it, there's a lot of those like back and forth uh where it's just like everyone's trying to one up each other like a lot of like yeah Martin Mule and uh 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 Michael McKean are are just kind of like going at it or or even Christopher Lloyd like you could see their their talent and and their and their timing that is there it's just sometimes i i think their performances rise above the the content like because because sometimes even the jokes aren't written well but they're just delivered in such an absurd uh, absurd way i think it works better definitely they're definitely the standouts i mean that's they're the two people i was excited about this movie those two you know tim curry obviously right um uh, but my favorite character i mean not to be uh you know just a <laughs> dude about this is right. uh is uh the the maid right yeah i mean uh colleen camp yeah, like, Yvette, yeah, yeah. Uh, she's you know she was in Wayne's World and stuff, but she's uh, she's she's great with her really really terrible French accent. It's <laughs> it's so awful that it, it's wonderful. It's so it's so great too because she was a relative nobody you know back in in eighty five and I know like Madonna went for this role, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee went for this role, but literally Jonathan Lynn said uh, it was her her shape, her form that we, what we were really going for. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, okay. I can tell Yeah, we're back in 1985 making movies in the, in the Weinstein era. But you know what? <laughs> it was a good pick. You know, she, but I think she was funny too. Like there was those little subtle moments, like uh, Tim Curry is walking through the dark and then he's like, Oh, I found another doorknob. And then he, he turns it on and then like the shower hits him. Like I, like literally laughed out loud. And I think I was, I was at, like sitting at work and I'm wearing headphones and I'm just like laughing like a, like a weirdo, you know, by myself, like scaring people. Cause I, it, it caught me off guard. So there's, there's, there's still those moments. And, and even, um, you know, like Yvette, which was very confusing to me. Cause I don't know how much of a clue purist you, you were back in the day, but I always thought that Mrs. White was the maid. <laughs> I don't know that I thought that, <laughs> but now that you put that in my head, I'm like thinking of her image from the from the board game, and now I'm like, was she the maid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Like I, I, man, they they miscast. Well, and I mean, there was never like they made um, uh, Wadsworth a a uh, playable character, so to speak, because I guess he's the he's always like the NPC of of the game, the actual game. Um, but I'm glad they, you know, you have Tim Curry. You gotta you gotta put him in the fray, right? Um, it, <sighs> The, the the other thing that uh, you know I I swear I have more good things to say about this, but another thing that feels like it doesn't hold up, and we kind of alluded to, uh, to it with the with the handling of of the maid is it just has it just kind of paints the the women in kind of a, a weird way like it's very. Uh, it, it's a movie at very much of its time. Uh, it, it feels like it was made by a bunch of like dudes, and it feels kind of gross, you know. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll say yes and no on that. There's definitely those aspects, but uh, Miss Scarlet is, you know, she owns up to her sexuality and, you know, like her profession and everything that she's about, and, you know, talks a ton of smack uh, to the guys for for even thinking of her that way. And you've got Christopher Lloyd's character, uh, Professor Plum. Like he's all about it. He's all he's still in. <laughs> so I'm a. I, I don't know. I, I think that there are definitely elements of that, and uh, but I think that you also have characters that you know totally own up to their sexuality and and stand in front of it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, another 
another thing that did work very well was the actual setting. I think uh, even though that most of the characters weren't wearing their proper colors, again, if you're a clue uh, a clue purist, like I guess I was, I didn't even know I was until I guess I'm starting to review this movie. Um, but you know, like uh, Mrs. White, she's wearing she's like all in black until she kind of uh, undoes her her like cape or shawl or whatever, and it's like that brilliant white inside. Like Mr. White or Mr. Green's not wearing any green. Uh, Colonel Mustard's wearing brown, so it's like I guess there is brown mustard, but I digress. Either way, it's like no one's wearing their colors, and that was that was uh, a little bizarre. But the thing is, it, that's really cool, is that every, they they made the set the house like exactly set up like the board game. They did add like the cellar and some other. Um, other rooms that aren't in the game but even so far as they went with the trap door it the trap door leads to the same rooms in the movie as that does in the game i thought that was pretty cool that is pretty cool it's i didn't pick up on that that's uh uh yeah it's been a long time since i played clue i actually bought clue the other day because my girlfriend has never played clue so i bought, picked it up the other day we haven't played it yet but nice. we're gonna <laughs> that, that's gonna be the next episode of cult of films is we're going to review a live game of clue which is probably more entertaining <laughs> than this movie. No. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that I was alluding to earlier with the uh, the gimmick, this is when uh, studios still try to do like theater gimmicks. Where so when they made Clue, they made four different endings, and one of them just wound up on uh, the, the cutting room floor because it just wasn't good. You know, they just they just hated it, so they didn't even include it. Um, but the, you know, they did do the three different endings, and so what the theater gimmick was is they just expected people. To sh- they just thought that this was going to be the, a, a huge smash hit. And so they filmed the three endings, but they were only going to show one ending per viewing at a theater. So they wanted you to, to go and have like a replay value of going back to see the movie just to see that, what, three minutes of, of other ending, you know, because you have ending A, B, and C. Um which I think it was ending B was the only one with the Madeline Kahn, you know, m- the flames on the side of my head monologue, uh, which was which was the only improvised uh, lines in the entire movie. So, I, I mean, th- everyone showed up, saw it, you know, got one ending and, and then went home. They're just like, oh, no, you- you're supposed to go back. And everyone's like, no, oh, that movie sucked. I don't want to go back and see that just for an extra three minutes of a, of a different ending. That's a pretty good. It's a pretty good marketing ploy. If it had a better movie, maybe it would have turned out. But even then, then you just have the big arguments of like, well, what's canon? And if it made a lot of money, they'd probably make a sequel. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I guess the canon ending is, is ending C, and that's the one uh, yeah. where, where every, essentially everyone's guilty uh, except Mr. Mr. Green does wind up killing Wadsworth, you know, spoiler alert for a movie that came out in 1985, sorry. Uh, but yeah, you know, he, he, he winds up uh, killing Wadsworth. He makes it a, a, a point to be like, you know, because at the beginning when they're introducing themselves and he's just like, uh, you know, I work for the government and I'm a homosexual. And then like at the end, he's just like, ah, I got you guys. Now I'm going to go home to my wife. Like it just had to make sure that you knew that, you know, he wasn't gay. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <that's- laughs> Yeah, going back to like written by a bunch of dudes thing. <laughs> uh, that's the that's the one thing in it where I'm just like, like everybody has all these you know these deep dark secrets, and his secret is just that he's gay, and right. he's not even secret about it. He just doesn't tell his work. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's the reason. You know, think about that. That's the reason why he would be blackmailed. Like, is it, that that's the premise? I guess we didn't even talk about the premise of the film. Uh, you know, but uh, you know this gr- random random group of of people are all getting blackmailed by this this entity known as uh, Mr. Body, and yeah. They they all have a, a secret, and little do they know they're all connected somehow. They all work for the government. They all live in Washington D.C. And that was Mr. Green's big thing: is that he he's a homosexual. I I think if that movie would have been made today, or even I think it would have been more funny, is like after he shoots Wadsworth, and then the the police chief shows up, like he does in all the other endings. Like he and Mr. Green just start making out. I thought that would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> I think that this movie could you know actually serve from a like a reboot. And and done almost in that style where like it plays a little bit more into the LGBT community. I feel like could be one of those could be one of those movies, just because of I feel like it's got a lot of really bright characters that aren't so bright in this movie that could be fleshed out and be really bright characters and really outlandish and really ridiculous and just almost you could you could turn this into a musical if you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Clue. Absolutely. 
the musical. <laughs> well, we are we are getting uh, our reboot. I, I heard Ryan Reynolds is is helming the uh, the reboot of it. For Clue? Yeah. I had no idea. I'm super excited about that. I you know uh, there was there was a time where you know anything that Ryan Reynolds was was attached to, and I was just like, Eesh. you know, I, I wasn't excited at all until he kind of found his own creative voice and stopped making, you know, Sandra Bullock films every two seconds. And now I think, uh, you know, a, a Ryan Reynolds helmed clue project. I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think he's going to direct it of course, but you know, he, he's kind of the driving force behind it. Like he, like he was with Deadpool. So I think that could absolutely work. I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't know. I, this is just one of those movies that I feel like could actually serve a reboot because, most reboots I don't feel like are warranted, but this is a movie that doesn't feel like it holds up today. I know it's got a big diehard fan basis, but me personally, I just I didn't feel like it really held up that much and could probably use a fresh take. Yeah, and, and that is that is bizarre because this is, you know, like you, I would say every movie up until this point that I've reviewed for this for this project uh, on the Cult of Films, I've, I've held quite a, uh, a affection for or like a love for because that's what, you know, cult movies are. They're, they're these movies that are so beloved by so many, but I've never seen – at least on this uh, on this show or, or all the films that I've I've researched, there was never so many that are so divided. Even the hardcore people, like e people, either hate Clue or absolutely like it's sacrosanct, which I just don't get. Like I I think now, you know, I, I thought it was fantastic when I was younger. I think now it's it's okay. Like if I were to put uh, like I don't know a letter grade on it, this would be like a C plus movie just for on performance alone. Uh, but it, you know, I think it's worth talking about just because it does have, even though it, it is such a smaller niche or a smaller pool of, of cult followers, I, it still has a cult following. For sure. It's got a, you know, it's, it's a 59% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is just 1% low of being fresh, like 60% is fresh. So, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not the worst movie in the world, but that's only from 27, you know, critic reviews at, you know, in 2019. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it does have an 86 percent uh, on audience scores out of 94,000 people. So 94,000 people think, you know, 86. So I, a lot of people like that, like this movie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another fun fact, Carrie Fisher was supposed to play Miss Scarlet, but she had to go to rehab. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know why we're laughing at that. <laughs> I feel terrible. Hey, Carrie Fisher was very open with That's with like all of her drama and all that stuff. Yeah, it's fine to it's fine to laugh. It's yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Clue, uh, Clue was something. Like I said, either the the first or second best film Jonathan Lynn ever did. That's not saying a ton. Um, it was uh, it was funny at times. Uh, really, when it was on, it was really on. It was uh, probably uncomfortably sexy for some. Uh, but it was it was a film that I, I would still suggest people go watch. Um, you know, if you if you're interested in, in cult films at all, just for the cast alone. I mean, it felt like a, a lot lesser version of like a young Frankenstein. I felt like that's kind of how the jokes are, um, where it, it is just like that super, super dry, quippy, um, you know, you got to keep up because they're just flying at you like a hundred miles a minute. It, it doesn't kind of give you any lull to, while the jokes are happening, it doesn't give you any lull to, to really pick up on everything you have to really pay close attention until and then it just like kind of screeches to a halt as a film um but yeah i think that if you know you are interested in anything like tim curry or, or you know just cult films in general i still think it's an important film to watch i think that if you're into comedies from that era if you like comedies from the 80s which i mean i do too you know i mean, I mean that's, there's a lot of really good comedies from the 80s but if you're into 80s comedies and you're looking for something that is different you haven't seen before go for it if you haven't seen it uh it's it's enjoyable i think that it the middle of the movie kind of really slows down a little for me and you know i started to kind of lose interest but about the point where i was starting to lose interest it picked right back up so i think it's an enjoyable film and if you're into that sense of humor you'll probably enjoy it more so than i did <laughs> 
Absolutely. Well, that is our review of Clue from 1985 by Jonathan Lynn, Deborah Hill, and John Landis. What did you all think of Clue? Are you part of that, you know, kind of smaller percentage that really, really loved it? And tell us why we're wrong. Why is why is Clue the best 80s movie that I that I've heard? Like, you don't even know some of the the actual reactions I've heard from people like that hold this movie is such like a the sacrosanct, you know, comedy from the 80s. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I liked it. I get it, but I don't. I don't get that much. But you know, tell us that we're wrong. Tell us in the comments, or uh, you know, like like this video, thumbs down if we're just completely wrong. That's fine. Uh, you know, any interaction is interaction. Uh, but yeah, that's that's our that's our episode. Tony Walters from Rad Entertainment. Where can everyone find you? And thank you, uh, sir, for for coming back on the channel. Always a blast having you. Hey, thanks for having me on the channel. I really enjoy being on the show. Uh, you guys can find me at Rad Entertain on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, but I don't really use much of that anymore. You might be able to find me better at Tony Walters Photography on Instagram, actually. That's kind of kind of where I, at least I'm, I'm keeping things a little bit more up to date. Um, but Rad Entertainment doing some cool stuff. We're in the process right now. We're producing a movie called Death Care. And I just went and helped out on a movie called Inverted over the weekend. So we we got our hands in some stuff, and I'm working on a documentary that I'll be announcing soon as far as what that's all about. So Always killing it in the studio with the camera, my man, Tony Walters. You can find me right here on this very channel. They said, we said. You could also contact me personally. You could talk to me about, I love talking movies. I love talking cult movies. I love talking Magic the Gathering, for shit's sake. You want to talk to me about anything, you could do that. Uh, the best place would be on on Twitter at Orzov Dunn. You can listen to the Cult of Films in podcast form on all your on all the regular platforms like iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, um, and you know, leave me five apples or whatever the the fuck you do on iTunes. I'm not sure, but <laughs> just just rate it. Uh, but until next time, go watch more cult films or something. I still don't have a sign off for this. You got something? <laughs> um, no, I don't got anything. Perfect. <laughs> Yes, I did it. I killed Yvette. I hated her so much. It, it, the, it, flame, flames, flames on the side of my face, breathing, breath, heaving breaths, heaving.